How you doing, Michael? Hello, senor. How are you? How's everything? I'm great. Fantastic, really. Never been better. Really? I'm glad yeah. to hear that. That yeah. makes me sincerely happy. Part when of it's because happy, of our... When you're happy, yeah. I'm happy. I didn't know that. If I'd known yeah. that sooner, this year would have been very different. Um, I'm mostly happy because of our guest. Because she always makes me happy when she's around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is why. Uh, and, you know, we're having some of, uh, some of our favorite guests are, are coming back on uh, a second time as we wind down here. We're down to this is the first of the last nine episodes. And we're having some of our favorite guests. And this one being one of our most favorite. She's been acting and singing since the age of seven. Star of stage and screen. I saw her on Broadway. She was great. Has appeared in 60 different films and TV shows, including Entourage, Ugly Betty, Guys with Kids, Magnum P.I., How I Met Your Mother. Has a very successful podcast with our good pal Robert Isla called Pajama Pants. And I think she may have another podcast. We got to talk to her about that. She's appeared in 72 episodes of The Sopranos as Middle Soprano. And this is the second time we've had her on. Please welcome Jamie Lynn Sigler. What an intro. Yay. Thank you. Jamie Lynn. Yay. Hi. Hi. Right. She is. How are you? <laughs> Don't you have two podcasts? Uh, yeah, but I took a pause from the other one. That was a parenting one. You know, for me, that one, I just we always wanted to feel like we were growing with it. And during COVID, you know, with quarantine and young kids, it felt like we were just complaining all the time. And that's not what I wanted to put out. Yeah. So that's what this podcast is about. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. It's, it's been a while. It's become, <laughs> that. It's become lots of complaining. <laughs> that, that, that's um, all we do is complain. <laughs> you know, that's life. So listen, uh, Jamie, what, what we want to talk about is uh, mostly, so here we are, they call it season six, we call it season seven, me and Michael. It's the last nine episodes, we started shooting in 2006, <laughs> what was your feeling going into the, the the last six. We had a big contract negotiation. Right? Mm -hmm. We all got raises. Mm -hmm. That took a little while. Once that happened, what did you feel like? We were relieved, happy, sad, what? I was a whole mixture of emotions. You know, I think being a young girl who started on the show, you know, at 16 and then I was 26, I think there was uh, you know, an excitement of like, what's going to be next, what's to come. Um, but then I think as we got closer to wrapping up the show, um, it was more um, a little bit of fear, uh, a, a lot of sadness. Um, no, it was, you know, for 10 years, just knowing that we always had this to go back to, um, not even for job security, but just these people, you know, you guys saw me through so much of my life and growing up. And, you know, while I wasn't a good communicator of how much you guys really shaped me, you did. And um, just knowing that I wasn't going to have that anymore was I, I remember having a really hard time with it. Yeah, I felt that in a lot of ways, too. I just more about um you know, I was not a kid when I started like you were, but it was more about when not working with these people on a daily, weekly, monthly, year in, year out basis. Mm -hmm. And and I realized I would I wanted to move on. I was ready, you know, because I'm I'm that type of person. I like moving forward and optimistic about the future. But I was also really going to miss miss everybody. Yeah. 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 I uh it didn't really hit me until like January when we came back from Christmas break, you know, and I remember saying, well, this is the last time I'm going to work with this guy. Right. Last time I'm going to shoot here in, you know, Vesuvio. And, and last time I had a scene with Dominic and then it started really hitting me at the beginning. It was happy to be back, you know, yeah. but then yeah. there was the fear of I may never work again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This might be it. 
which a lot of people feel all the time. But, you know, this might be it. I felt, yeah, I wasn't one of those guys that said, oh, you're on The Sopranos, you'll work forever. Uh, I was more like, well, maybe this is as far as I come. And that's the end of the dance. So that's well, look I, at you. You are going to be the guy that outworks us all, though, after. No, but, you know, I mean, honestly. I yes, could, I know what you mean. And you I never know. You know, my, yeah. you, know, just, you know, and it was sad. It was very sad. Each yeah. Time. Last time was this director and how much fun. And, you know, I mean, it's hard to explain to people how the, it, it was being on the show. And I, I agree with you. And now that I'm thinking about it, the filming of those few last scenes I had in the last episode um, are the ones that stick out the most in my mind. I think because I was realizing that I needed to hold on to them because it was ending. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I can remember the last thing I shot on the stage. It was like a insignificant scene in the sense that it was just like me walking through Tony's apartment. Rob was in it. And I had done it a couple of times and then they're like, okay, we need one more. And I remember thinking, it's just literally a shot of me walking across the room. Okay. And when I opened the door to make my exit, the entire crew was standing there as well as David. And they just all started clapping. And I just obviously was overcome with emotion. And the only thing that I could say was thank you. And I just kept saying, thank you. It just, it, I completely, I mean, I could cry now thinking about it. It was just a, one of the most overwhelming moments of my life because it was just like everyone standing right there, you know, having just a moment for me and just, you know, the whole 10 years just kind of flashing through and just what it's meant for all of us. And it was amazing. The whole experience really was. Uh, yeah. Now that, the last thing that I shot, they had killed me off in February. And then I think I came back in March or April to reshoot something. And Henry Bronstein directed it. Yeah. But second unit? Yeah. And it was no. me getting out of the car going into the train store. So Crazy. it was like, you know, anticlimactic. Okay, that was my last day. Right. You know, and then, then I had then I came back. But there well, was no actual happened for me. Well, no that was my last like like day on the stage. But my actual last thing I ever, ever shot was running into Holstein's. Oh, really? And that was the last, which is, you know, pretty much the end of the show as well. Because I remember the crew had like kegs of beer. I remember Ginger like wheeling out like a big cooler full of beer for everyone because that that was it. That was it for everybody. Yeah. Why were you rushing into Holstein? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I was gosh. just going to ask you that. I was just. I, gonna- I actually think like the parallel barking question. It's just I, I'm never not going to be asked it. I've just really come to terms with that fact. Every everyone just always asks me how my parallel parking is, but it was you know it added to the suspense of it all. I guess. But David told us no when we had David on the show. He said it had nothing to do with nothing, right, Michael? He just said, I don't know if that's true. Maybe he's just being cagey because because then I said to him, yeah, but, you know, the audience knows it's almost 10 o'clock. This is the last episode ever. It's almost 10 o'clock. You're rushing into the diner. You're parking and it's very kind of your this tension. And just the fact that it's almost 10 o'clock, there's tension because we know this is it. What's going to yes. happen? Yes. Yes. You know, he I said guess. it was just a young girl parallel parking, having a hard time. That's what he told us. I mean, I believe him. And sometimes I think, you know, we could, you know, his his the simplest things, you know, because it's part of a show that everything feels like it has meaning and it probably does. You know, maybe we are looking too far into it, but, you know, they def- it definitely felt that way for everybody and me, too. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he's being cagey and just trying to not, you know, he's tired of talking about it. He doesn't want to come <laughs> up with something defining. I really don't know. I mean, because there's definitely he's created. He created tension in that scene. Mm-hmm. Now oh, yeah. We don't know what happens or nothing or maybe nothing happens after we go to black. But there was something building in that scene. Absolutely. You know? And I, I still don't know what it is. You know, or, Alan, I don't know. Alan Taylor recently came out saying he thinks. 
Alan Taylor, the director of Many Saints and numerous Soprano episodes, he says he thinks Tony died. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of going back to that line of thought again. I don't. I, I do disagree. too. Yeah, you think you do? he died? I do. I disagree. I think he's alive. Alive and well. I don't think anything happened. What you saw is what you saw. That's what I think. Some people say the whole three o'clock thing was about that episode that the guy in the members only jacket was at coming from the direction of three o'clock at Tony Soprano. Oh, wow. there's those references to three o'clock with Paulie and the ghost and all that. It comes up several times. He wakes up at three o'clock and is spooked. And people think that that's where that comes from. I mean, people wow. read that far into that. I, I mean, that's, that's what I was just nothing. thinking. That's just uh, wow. That's amazing how how much people care and have paid attention to all that stuff. That's incredible. And Jamie, yeah. you think he died? You know, I think if I if I have to choose, yes, I do. Did they all I die? Do. Just him. Well, that, just that's him. what I was going to say. I think I just was him. Say, they didn't just kill him. They would kill the whole family. Well, you know, yeah. You'd think they would kill the whole family? I think they would. They're just going to shoot Tony Soprano? I think they would wipe out the whole family right there. That would have been the worst ending ever in and the And you think like Meadows, Meadow watched it from the doorway? Listen, I think he's alive and well. He's eating Okay, onion that's rings. right. <laughs> he's eating onion rings. Meadow is still maybe or maybe not got married. I don't know. Tell me why Meadow can't hold a boyfriend. I mean, like you. I mean, she's not the easiest. Like you, she's beautiful. She's nice. She's intelligent. She's smart. Yeah. Why can't she keep a boyfriend? Well, look, she definitely had uh, some uh, some similarities to her father, like they used to say, some personality similarities. And I think she's tough. And I think that, um, well, the, my favorite thing about her was how fiercely loyal she was, whether it was to her views or her family or her friendships. Um, yeah. And I would like to think that she would continue just being incredibly loyal. And I think somehow I would like to think somehow in some way that she's stayed connected to the family in a in a, in a way um, with her career. I, I think uh, we talked about it, right, Michael, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think Meadow just has to wind up with some kind of a wise guy. Talk. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 she can't go with the dentist, the straight guy. She needs to go. Just no. I think the dentist broke up with her. I think she, that whole the whole lifestyle was too much for him. Yeah. He didn't want to deal. He didn't want to be Tony Soprano's son-in-law. I Pin. think she's got to be. She has to be like with some kind of a wise guy type. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think the the most in love she ever was was with Jackie Jr. Have you ever dated a uh, kind of uh, Italian, you know, Guinea yeah. white guy type? Yeah, Italian? yeah, in high school. Yeah. <laughs> Guidos, little Guido. Yeah, full on. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It was. It was. It was also the time we were filming the show, so maybe that was why. <laughs> but yeah, I never I went for girls like that. I never went for. I don't think I've ever dated an Italian girl, really, for any length of time. You know, they're tough, too tough for me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't know. Tough. No, it's not the toughness. It's the I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know if they were like Meadow, maybe not. She's <laughs> she, <laughs> she was tough. Very. Uh, when did you see when the show the last episode? Where did you watch it? Did you watch it at home? No, they had a screening at um, HBO in Manhattan. Uh, I remember it was I was there. Dominic was there. Aida was there. Sharon Angela was there. Um, it was that in night. like. The, yes. That night? Yes. Uh, no, I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was the actual Sunday night. Um, but I remember there was press there and you know, how they have that tiny screening room in HBO. Have you ever been there in the New York offices? Small, no. probably like yeah. sat maybe 20 people, 25 people. Um, it was really cool to watch it in like a theater type experience. Um, but at, when they cut to black at the end, everybody, everybody in that room turned around to the projector and thought something happened. No one knew. Yeah. Even though I, Saw the script. I, 
I didn't, I was very surprised at how it was. I was yeah. straight to black. I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. We yeah. were all very drunk when we watched it. <laughs> we were? Where Me, were you? Michael and Jim, we were in Florida at the Hard Rock. <laughs> Oh, cool. And we were very, very drunk. <laughs> Floppily drunk. As you really? should have I been. I don't remember that. <laughs> I guess. Why you don't remember that? <laughs> I have no recollection of that. <laughs> Being drunk at that event. <laughs> I mean, I see the picture. You know, we used a picture from the event in the book. You're like practically laying down. You were just <laughs> you're on a couch. This I was, was in bad shape. We, well, we had a, a appearance the night before in Foxwoods and flew down in a private yeah. jet the next day. You were announcing people who were in the audience, like people we knew from New York. <laughs> oh, Dito, ladies and gentlemen, Frankie C from Little Italy. I was out of my mind. I was with Jim yeah. the Friday in Atlantic City. Drunk. Then we flew a little plane to Foxwoods and then we had the big plane. Oh, you wow. guys were in my room. I went to bed. You guys were playing cards until three or four in the morning. Wow. It was ugly. That's like, I, by the way, that's probably every fan of the show's fantasy that you guys actually would hang out and, and do stuff like that, you know? <laughs> oh, God. Well, oh. we did plenty of that. Yeah. There's plenty of that. We know that. You never, you're not, you, Jamie, you didn't drink a lot. Did you drink a lot? Not really. Not really. No, I've never, never. I mean, I, I can hang. Was, Rob could tell you I, I hang, yeah. but I'm no. Yeah, you, you back then, and I don't even think Rob had drank much back then, did he? Uh, with us, yeah. With us? No, not with you guys. Not with us. No, 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 no. I know he was uh, running around. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so what what show you you filming a new show? What show is that? Yes, it's called Big Sky. It's, um, David Kelly's show on ABC. It's in their second season. Um, I'm kind of recurring throughout the season. Um, it's fun. It's uh, definitely a different type of role for me. I play a small town waitress who um, it follows these two female detectives and I hire them because I think my boyfriend's missing and drama ensues and I'm kind of not who I say I am. Uh, oh, that's cool. That's great. Yeah. Of all your boyfriends on the show, Meadows boyfriends, mm -hmm. who, who do you think she enjoyed most? Um, well, I think it's a tie. I mean, Jackie Jr.'s her first love, her first everything. I think it was like where we just saw her kind of um, at her most vulnerable, um, which I enjoyed, you know, for her to kind of have that side of, you know, come out of her because she was always, you know, just so tough and trying to know it all. And she's got it together. And I think he really is one that, um, you know, broke those barriers down a bit, but then Finn, I mean, he was, you know, her college love and I love Will and he was around for, you know, a couple of seasons and we had a lot of fun stuff to do together. Yeah. Will's great. We like Will. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not talking about Jason who I'm talking about the character. Jackie really mentally was no match for Meadow. I mean, no. he was not the brightest bulb. I can't, I mean, Will, uh, Finn's character, Will's character, Finn, was very intelligent, you know, in college, dental school, Columbia, all that. And they did definitely see eye to eye in a lot of things about the world and their philosophies and stuff like that. So I, my, I could see them together much more than. Yeah, but I still felt like Meadow was kind of playing a part with Finn. Do you know what I mean? It's who she wanted to be. It's who Carmela wanted her to be. It's why she was going to Columbia. Uh, but I just think Jackie Jr. matches really who she is. Really? Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, I think Carmela, she wore that medal going to Columbia on her sleeve. I mean, oh, is, yeah. We're in the city, <laughs> going to the city. <laughs> the city. The city, the city, the That's city. That's right. That's right. My daughter goes to Columbia, which is a great thing, going to Columbia. No, but, but it's, it's such a thing. It's true. Oh, yeah. oh, she did such a great job with that. But then she didn't like it when you started having very diff uh, different opinions about the, mm -hmm. the world than she did mm -hmm. stuff that you were learning at Columbia and seeing, you know, ex things you were exposed to that were formulating your, you know, opinions about society and the world and stuff. And that she didn't like. But I think that Meadow brought a lot of that home just to spite her because of she knew how much Columbia meant to her. I just, I still think, you know, mother daughter relationships 
are really complicated and theirs was, you know, no exception. And sometimes I felt, at least for me, a lot of my intention when it came to, and my ob- objective when it came to Meadow and Carmela's conversations was I was just, you know, throwing back in her face what, you know, what she wanted. You know what I mean? What, or what she thought she wanted. What she thought she wanted. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Also, Carmelo, to me, the most contradictory character on the entire show. Mm-hmm. She was a racist, a flat out racist. She was an elitist. Yep. She was a phony Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Am I right? You're absolutely yeah, right. No, no, no. Yeah. And, she and she came this close. To having sex with Father Phil. This close. Yeah, you felt it. All right. So, mm-hmm. Jamie, before I let you go, your opinion, is Tony Soprano alive or dead? I think he died. Yeah, I'm thinking that now. I've, I've been going back and forth over the years. I'm, I'm kind of going with you. I do want to ask you one last thing is what do you think is the legacy of the show? Oh, my gosh. It's a broad question, but whatever comes to mind, you know. Well, I think it's a lot about perspective, and I think it's a lot about um, the way we choose to see our life. I think in that last scene, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I talked about this with you, but I didn't. If I didn't, I think that last scene, I think his whole life was like that. Do you know what I mean? I think that there was always a threat to their lives. And I think they sure. always knew that, but they had to live a certain way and just pretend it wasn't there. And I just, I think that this is, you know, they can't escape it. This is their life. And I think that this is the way these people have to, they have to make a choice every day, you know, whether to see it or not. Yeah. Um, but I think that the legacy, as far as just beyond the characters, I mean, <clears throat> Life is messy. People are messy. People are flawed. I think, you know, just the way that people can were able to fall in love with these exceptionally flawed and not very good people, Um, you know, but to to me, I, I think in like as I'm growing, I feel like I don't look at people so much as good and bad. I just more look at people of kind of just making choices with what they've learned and what they've been exposed to in their lives. And um, I think this show, when you watch it, allows you to do that. If that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I, I, I agree with you. Jamie, thank you so much. Oh, you guys always. One of my most favorite people to talk to, honestly. Yeah. Thank you. The best to you, the kids, your family, your husband. And we'll talk I'll to see you, you on pajama pants next week. Yes, I can't wait. Thank you so much for doing that. And Steve, we need to get you back too. Yeah, uh, they like to talk to Michael better. He'll analyze the whole show. <laughs> Who's they? She's they. It's her show. What do you mean? And Rob, what do you mean? Michael, he'll, Michael will explain everything to you about the... I, That's I re- what we want. <laughs> he'll explain it. He'll explain everything. Mike. He knows way more than I do. I'm just kind of like a prop. I'm a prop. You're more than that. No, it'll be good. I could talk freely without Steve being there. To, you know about how it's been working with him. It'll, we'll have a mo- we'll have an opportunity to really get into some stuff next week. I'm glad we will barely interrupt you. All right, sounds good. <laughs> I love you, you both. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. See you. Thank you. There she hey, goes. That Jamie is an interview with a ton of information, and so far. Uh, uh, we got one person who thinks Tony Soprano is dead. We're, We're going gonna... to do a tally, huh? We're going to yes. do a, a final tally here. Yeah, yes, we are, including David Chase on the finale. I'm going to flat out ask him. Let's not gotcha. pussyfoot around anymore. Is Tony Soprano alive or dead? Okay. All right. Let's take a break and get into the episode. Here we are, the back nine. This is it. This is it. This is what we've been talking about. But before we get started, I want to show my Webby Award. You got yours, right? I have one, too. Yeah, it's in my bedroom. Do you have it next to your Emmys? Your Emmy? No? No. Don't you have, like, an area for all your awards? 
No, nah, they're kind of scattered around the house. Oh, yeah? Well, very proud. Thanks to the fans. Webby Award. I got it. In yeah. I thought it was great. This is the back nine. This is season seven, episode one. Um, this is one of my favorite episodes. Uh, um, it's really good. You're excellent in it. This is some of the best work you've ever done, I, I have to say. I mean, I, I would imagine you'd agree because you, you do some really great shit in here. Yeah, David really liked it. Uh, I was just talking. To, I had, was talking to him, and this is one of his favorite episodes. I mean, he loves them all, obviously. What I what I liked about this, so what kind of I was surprised, even though I've been on the show now for five seasons, whatever, that David had the confidence in me, even to this, you know, right? It's the last nine episodes, and this is the beginning of the end, really. Yeah, right and yeah. that he had the confidence in me to give me so much stuff, you know, uh, you know, give me a lot to do as much as anybody, if not more, obviously, right? Uh, and they called me, and we had a rehearsal, me, Jim, Edie, and uh, Aida. You did? And, you had a rehearsal? Yeah, we went to Silver. One of the rare, one of the rare times it was rehearsal. My only time. So. Was it was it during production before you started? Before. Uh, how how far before? I'd say a week or two. And you sat around a table and you read some scenes. What yeah, was it we like? went. I went to Silver Cup and we went up to one of the offices upstairs on the second floor, and we were in the room. It was just the five of us, and we sat around the table and we read it and asked questions. And you know, it's the first time I ever heard that word splitter. When he calls, you know, uh, Tony says his mother. Janice calls Janice. Livia a splitter. Yeah. She's a splitter, split the children. Uh, and, you know, we asked questions. Edie had questions, Jim. And just, you know, I mean, I thought it was incredible, the, the, the script. And we were going to head upstate. You know, it was supposed to be near Canada, but that's not where it was shot. You it know. was up Putnam County near near Peekskill, Mayapack. Where I, I kind of lived up there. Uh, I did live up there in seventy seven to eighty three. I went to high school not far from there. Um, wasn't it Roy Scheider's house? Was that true? Roy Scheider's ex. Yeah, it was his house. His ex wife got it in the divorce. And she right. rented it out. And, and and Babe Ruth had a house up there. Babe apparently, Ruth had too, a house right? next door, and next it door. was okay. uh, remodeled with pictures of Babe Ruth and. You know, blah blah blah. You know, they. It's only about an hour away from New York City. It's, it's not, not that, that far. far. We stayed in Tarrytown, uh, in a hotel there. For yeah. for you know, we were supposed to be there for two weeks. Uh, I came home on the weekend, but we were up there basically for two weeks, and we stayed in the hotel, and we were deep in. So you know, the trailers and stuff were a little far away. You know, you couldn't get. They couldn't get down all the way to the lake. So. The dressing room was like the Babe Ruth house. Supposedly, the story goes, he would go there in the winter, bring, uh, you know, gomadas up, showgirls. Uh, they would land on an ice plane kind of thing. You know, I don't know if that's true or not, but we were there. He so lived they, down the street from me here in Manhattan, actually. The Ansonia. Yeah. Yeah, for a while. He lived over there. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, we were up there, the whole crew, I mean, uh, one night we had a party. I mean, it was whatever, 150 people. What, what's the crew? 100, 150 people. We were all up there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, at uh, the hotel. I think it was a Marriott. They had a big suite. No. You know? uh, I think it was. And then Jim, uh, we all went out to dinner. Jim took us out to that nice steakhouse downstairs. And Jim uh, took a bunch of us out to dinner, the crew and stuff, one night. And... Uh, uh, we had steaks and stuff when we were up there. And it was great. It was just the four of us and the crew. Yeah, it reminds me a little, like most of the episode is you four have, or a or combination of you, you and Jim at one point, him and Edie. But it's almost, it reminded me a lot of uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, that play by Edward Albee, which was made into a movie that Mike Nichols directed with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. The two couples... This one night where they're drinking together and revelations come out and there's bickering and fighting and tension. It gets really nasty. This reminded me a lot of that. The title, there were two different titles before they landed on this Soprano Home movie. Obviously, Soprano Home movies 
you know, she gives him the DVD of old Super 8 movies. But it was a once called A Few Kind Words, which they mentioned in this in the episode. Johnny Boy Soprano used to say, I don't need a gift. Just give me a few kind words, which kind of reminds me of you a little bit. When you said, what do I need? I need a sandwich. I need a couple of drinks, a few good friends. My and that's it. And at one point it was called Chew the Fat, which actually it, it was a last minute change because even in some of the TV guides, it was called the episode the title was oh, Chew really? the Fat. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I yeah. never knew that. You yeah. Know, I, I didn't know. You, that. And also, did you know that you were submitted for an Emmy for Best Supporting Actor with this episode? Uh, I did not know that. You were? Yeah. I read that. Aida was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. She got a nomination for this episode. Um, uh, you know what else is interesting? Tony Soprano's birthday, which is the kind of the center of this episode, the birthday celebration, was August 22nd. You know who else his birthday is August 22nd? I have no idea. David Chase. Ah, there you go. I didn't know that. Yeah, interesting, right? Ah, wow. So this was written by Diane Frolov and Andrew Schneider, four out of, this is the fourth out of their four. Also David Chase and Matt Weiner, directed by Tim Van Patten. Yeah, a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun to do. I was very, I was kind of proud, you know, and, uh, and you know, like sitting at the Monopoly table, and I know, listen, by this time, I've done, you know. A lot, yeah. A ton of episodes, and yeah. even then, it was like, Jesus, I mean, you know, Aida's an Emmy nominee, and Jim, and Edie, and uh, like I said to myself, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, like even at that point, it was like, this is pretty fucking cool that I'm doing this, you know? I mean, I, And great material, I mean, for uh, an actor. I mean, these scenes were so uh, well written and so interesting. So really good. good. So good. Uh, there's a flashback. We open up with Johnny Sack, uh, with Tony outside Johnny Sack's house, running through the snow where the FBI is after him. Also in this episode... There's a deleted scene where Tony and, and Bobby uh, blow up Janice's hat with uh, firecrackers. Where, where does that happen? Uh, up at the lake house. The lake house. Uh, and I don't know why they cut it out, but it was pretty funny. Uh, it's on. Well, this is, uh, it opens with a Chiron, like a title card for 2004, which they really didn't do much on The Sopranos. We see that scene of him running away from the feds at Johnny Sack's house. But now there's a new beat to that scene. We reveal that a kid sees Tony running in the snow, dropping his gun. Cut to that night. The kid goes outside with a flashlight, picks up the gun, finds it, accidentally shoots it. It's really loud. And he kind of smiles. And then instead of a title card to show that now we're back in the present, 2007, it's a close up on the newspaper which says 2007 budget in the headline so we don't need a title card they cleverly use the newspaper as the title card to establish the passage of time we're back in the present 2007 yeah star ledger is thrown on the driveway there's a loud knock on the door 6 a.m tony looks out the window carmela is this it this is you know they've talked about this they prepared for this this is what they do the fbi or the cops they come early in the morning, they knock on your door. You know, they don't come in the middle of the day. It's like usually early in the morning, catch you by surprise. Uh, catch you by surprise, better chance at your home, a little bit more vulnerable. You know, you're probably in bed and you're not reaching for, uh, you know, whatever, I guess. Uh, you know, the detective answers, probably got a warrant for your arrest. For what? And he says, where's the FBI? Uh you know, uh, we don't take any chances when it concerns a legal firearm containing, and it's so dramatic, you know, contain, containing hollow point ammunition. Tony knows it's not that big a deal or it wouldn't be local cops. Local cops is the giveaway. But listen, they're going with a lot of cops. This guy's a gangster. They don't know. Is there bodyguards with guns? Who the fuck knows what they have? I mean, it's funny is this whole... For what, right? You know, say, for what? Well, the guy's the fucking gangster. You know what I mean? It's like they're shocked almost at the cops. It's like the attitude that these cops are persecuting Tony Soprano, a yeah. man who makes his living off of murder, robbery, criminal activity. You know, it's almost like, you know, they're, they're, they're outraged. 
Yeah, that well, this oh, could happen. That's how it's going to be. And she yells, "He's got a medical condition." Carmela says, uh, "Meadow, she I want to see the the model. Model. And then uh, when they cuff him, he gives the cop the finger. You know, Tony gives the cop the finger. Uh, in the car, Meadow, Carmela, AJ sleeping in the back seat. They're driving. AJ the doesn't car. give a shit. Driving to the police, and he's wearing a Beansies pizza shirt, which now we know he's working. This was was Tony's idea a, a while back, and now he's working at Beansies. He's working at Beansies. We see later on. He see he lies. He says he's working. Uh, and Janice calls. Did you talk to Tony about coming to the lake for his birthday? Uh, she says Tony was arrested this morning. Weapons charge. They're booking him in North Cardwell before they take him to Newark. She's like, it's a gun, no big deal. Jan is very. She's nonchalant. a little annoyed that it's it's kind of put a damper on her plans. Sure. Which I I want to ask you this: besides celebrating her brother's birthday, what's Janice's agenda? She because she doesn't do anything without an agenda. Uh, you know, but I, I don't know here. They already got the house. He bought them the mansion. I think it's more. You know, it's also she's pushing Bobby to become a boss. That's what I think. Yeah. I mean, she's pushing Bobby. You know, they got the mansion now. So she's got that. This is a big, beautiful house. Got she it wanted it. Place. She got it. She wanted that. Now she wants him to move up the ladder. And this is the way. Get close to Tony. Part well, of the family. Family absolutely. bonds. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, he'll still make bail. No big deal. Uh, she tells Bobby he's sleeping. If you got hollow points and anything, hollow point bullets and anything, get them out of there today. Carmella, and she knows the system. That's the other thing. Like, she's not emotional. Oh, he's arrested. She just knows, oh, it's a gun charge. He's going to make bail. She knows how things work. She's like a gangster herself. She's, she's a, a murderer. Gangster. gangster. What the fuck? Uh, Carmela looks at Tony. You, you know, I always thought, I don't know why, but the ending, before I knew the ending, I thought... It was going to be Janice kills Tony and tries to take over the family, her and Bobby. That's that's a good idea. Her orchestrating it. I always Her and Bobby, and she's doing it behind Bobby, like standing oh, yeah, there, he pulling wasn't. strings behind him. Oh, no, she was orchestrating it, pulling the strings to get that done. That's how Kind of like Livia was doing. That's what I, I kind of thought that that was very possible ending, you know. That's uh, a good idea. Carmella looks at uh, Tony's clothes in the car. God damn it, AJ, there's tomato sauce all over the pants. I mean, he just doesn't give a shit, this kid. Talk about doesn't a Doesn't give a shit. Breath. Meadow asks, why, why this huge show of force? Was it to humiliate, you know? The show of force was that all about humiliating dad, you know? Uh, the jail, Tony walks into the cell, sits down on the bench. There's a guy taking a dump, pulling his pants down, which David loves that humor. Toilet humor, right? Was the guy fought, I think? Does he fought that in there? Yeah, but I think he's sitting on the urinal, it looks like, not the toilet. That's what it looked like to me. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's kind uh, of gross. Courtroom, Tony stands before the judge. Uh, now, Neil Mink, is that David Margolis, right? Is that his? David Margolis, yeah. Terrific actor. Just terrific. Yeah. And, a, and a nice, nice guy. Uh, we used to talk a lot the few times I seen him on set. I, I I always liked him a lot, you know. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, Your Honor, the police pulled over some kid. They found a baggie with cocaine residue. They found a gun loaded with hollow point bullets on the floor. So the kid, the kid snitched. It's a bullshit thing. Uh, it really is a ridiculous charge. Cut to, you know, Tony's out. We're at the social club on Mulberry Street. Trouble in Paradise. That is the Crests uh, featuring Johnny Maestro. The Crests' biggest hit was 16 Candles. Kind of a foreboding little title, Trouble in Paradise. Uh, Phil's home from the hospital. A lot of empty compliments. He's saying, you know, I got major coronary disease. You guys are all full of shit. You're a cranky fuck. He sees Johnny Sack's picture. And it really kind of makes him stop. What, 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 what do you feel is happening there? Well, I mean, he's uh, over Johnny Sack. He's the boss now. Ever since Johnny Sack was crying and now pled. He cried at the 
daughter's wedding, and now he pled guilty. He's done. Admitted, admitted being a member of the mafia. He's finished. He's done. They're breaking each other's balls. Uh, I'm just here to enjoy my grandchildren, my home, Phil says. He doesn't want any trouble. He's feeling better. Uh, and here comes Doc. And he starts singing, uh, uh, what? The girl, girl from Ipanema. Ipanema. And Young I and tall and tan and lovely. I talked to Terry Winter, who talked to David. As you talked about Phil coming out of the closet, it's possible that there were some theories that he may be gay. And it's kind of left up to your interpretation. So didn't, David didn't say no. Didn't say no. There are things out there. They mentioned Brokeback Mountain somewhere along the line. Uh, there is Phil. You know, there are people so homophobic that, you know, when he keeps going, he's a fucking disgrace. Fucking disgrace. Like overcompensating. Right. You know, I, you know, I had a guy, I had a guy years ago in Vegas. I, I produced a, uh, an album of gay comics. Uh, it was called Gay from Las Vegas. Some great comics. Bob Smith and, and Scott Thompson. He was one of the kids in the hall. Oh, he's funny. Yeah. Scott Thompson. Great really stuff. Funny. Four guys. Terrific, terrific CD. I produced it live, you know, from the Riviera Hotel. And I showed it to this friend of mine. And I said, hey, man, hey, take one of these. It's really funny. And he went, I don't even want to fucking touch that. And it was like, I said, what are you talking about? He was so, like, overcompensating. He was like, hmm, what's yeah, happening? Yeah, it makes you, uh, yeah, exactly. What's happening here? I mean, it's a, it's a CD wrapped in plastic. I mean, what, what, what do you, what? and a very funny one with talented guys, you know. And uh, that made me light bulb go off to me because yeah. it doesn't fit, you know, and, and uh, that's what I think here with Phil, you know, he was in jail for 20 years, comes out of the closet, he's grabbing the bed sheet, very possible. It's up to your interpretation, kind of like the ending. That's what Terry went to tell me. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that he ever even acted on those no, impulses. No. It, it, he could have, and we don't know, or he could not have. And he's, you know, internalized it to the point where he just, becomes a homophobe you know but there's something there's a touch of something there that's dr dan conti who was a real doctor and a good friend of frank vincent's yes. for before the sopranos uh it's just a funny little moment with him singing that song and he mm -hmm. says i'm here to enjoy my grandchildren which is exactly what tony soprano told him to do yeah and he uh, doc calls him uh, pork chop pork chop out in jersey oh, Got tony soprano, a yeah. weapon charge they're breaking balls. A little something here. Uh, Dominic Kianese Jr. is in the scene. He Dominic. has that line, yeah. He was probably going down on some sheep yes. down the, the, with the gun in the field. That's Dominic Kianese uh, Jr., who I knew way before I knew Dominic. I met Dom Jr. in 1985 or six. Our girlfriends both worked in a restaurant together, and we met. And we knew each other since then in kind of the downtown uh Acting, he was also done a lot of stand up comedy. I saw his stand up yeah, routine. Good guy, uh, a lot of fun, good guy. Great. We yeah. did a movie together two years ago called uh, Between Wars. He's great. Uh, he's a good friend and a great guy. So here's the New York crew in the club breaking balls. And Phil, I want to enjoy my home and my grandchildren. You know, can these guys, but can they? You know, do they need the power and the money, you know? Uh, Soprano House, A.J., Meadow, and Hector are watching TV. It shows a report on Tony, Silvio, and Carlo. Uh, uh, Tony, Silvio, and Carlo Tony, are there. Tony's doing the perp walk. They see him in handcuffs going into the uh, out of the court, whatever. Carmelo yells, tells him to take it or shut the TV. Uh, you know, there's uh, Paulie, take the ribbons down. Be, 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 everybody, our boy's coming home. Uh, and Bianca Blanca says they let him out already. And everyone kind of looks and he says, well, in her neighborhood, people don't get out right away. Sure. Which is a hundred percent true. I mean, if you Might don't have, have a good week. lawyer yeah. and if you can't make bail, if you're poor and you don't have the money to do that, you know, on, on charges much less than weapons, you'll stay Absolutely. in jail for a long time. Yeah. Uh, she he makes a point of saying, where's Christopher? 
uh, I guess, you know, he notices right away that Christopher is in the MIA. Christopher's in the doghouse. He's got his, Tony's got his balls broken about Juliana. He's still, you know, he's in the, sh in the shit house still. I think it's that. And also, uh, the movie w did not go down well with Tony. Christopher kind of distracted. And, uh, yeah. You know. And the Juliana thing really kind of bums him out. Uh, Bobby uh, calls Tony from the lake house. You want uh, you want me to come down? Bobby's uh, concerned. Do you need me down there? No, nothing a hot shower won't fix. We got the meeting with the Canadians, Tone. With these hassles, you should come up here. And he, t he looks at uh, AJ and the baby, and he probably figures, let me get the fuck out of here. And, you know. Uh, yeah. He feels his son's making a big mistake with this, and he doesn't really want to deal with it. He's kind of. The you know. first scene we shot, the first scene of the whole season was that phone call on my side, talking to Tony sitting at the lake. Oh, really? That was the first. Uh, we got up there. That was the first. Uh, uh, the first scene we, we shot was uh, me overlooking the lake there. Uh, this is uh, who was this? The DA's office. Yeah, that's the core. I guess it's a, it's probably somewhere in the uh, DA and Dan Castleman, who was our advisor on the and a know, real for DA the, huh? for the writing. He's the federal attorney. He's saying you got your cheap headline, but you, but we've been building a RICO case on this guy for five years, and you basically just blew it by bringing unnecessary attention on a petty charge that's not going to go anywhere. So they're pissed off. The song that comes in now. There's a little fade out after that scene. Fade in on the car, James Gang. We saw very recently uh, the Eagles. We saw Joe Walsh actually play this song, Funk 49, which was a James Gang song before the Eagles. Uh, he played it. We were both there. We didn't sit together, uh, I guess, because no. of your design. I had um, better seats than you. No, you chose not to sit with me. But I there's a line in that song that says, I think there's trouble brewing which is very appropriate. It's a cool song to have on the radio. Tony loves to listen to classic rock. This certainly would be on his playlist. Uh, 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 Tony and Carmelo are driving up to the lake house. Uh, Neil Mink, the attorney, calls. Uh, Essex County dropped the charges. I told you it was a piece of shit case. No decent prints. Uh, Santa Claus could have dropped a gun in the snow. Well, I love to say I owe you one. But I'm sure it's more than one. Carmela says, thank God. I really didn't want it hanging over your birthday. You know, no, so and she's a little stressed out with the phone service. She's got the broker with the house she's trying to sell, and she's all stressed out. Tony really doesn't want to hear it. Um, he's kind of glad. Uh, uh, do you like birthdays? You like your birthday? Yeah. I mean, I like to keep it simple. I don't like big parties. I'd rather just have my family, a couple of people go out to dinner, hang out together. This year, you know, it was really nice. My youngest flew in from California. My other two kids live in New York. They came in the afternoon. They gave me gifts. We walked to Central Park. We sat on my favorite spot in the park. We all sat there together. And then we went out to dinner. My cousin came with her kids and uh, Olmo, who plays drums in Zopa with me. And uh, it was great. Simple like that. That's what I like. Yeah, some people just what, the whole thing, you know. Night what do you night. like to do? I very low key. We this year we didn't even go out. Uh, we we uh, my wife and uh, the kids and uh, their boyfriend and husband came over. We cooked, you know, and, and just uh, hung out. That's what I like doing. Just you know, I don't want to go. I don't like the big thing. And no, you know, did you ever have a surprise? Did they ever give you a surprise party? Yeah. Horrified. My 40th. Horrified. Horrified. <laughs> right? So, so my wife, and it was a incredible party. So in Vegas, I got the big house, right? It was a week after my birthday, my 40th birthday. So, so, you, so you were really thrown off kilter. Yeah. We had gone out for my birthday. That was it. It was great. So I come home. And somebody that at work gave me like a set of luggage. You know, they give away if you win the slots. So the yeah. lady in marketing, you know, slipped me one here. You know, here to take uh, suitcase. And we were going to go to dinner with uh, the kid's godmother, the three of us. My wife calls, pick up a 12 pack of beer. All right, there's no cars. There's one car, the, the godmother's car in the, in the driveway. I go in, 
I got the luggage. I got the fucking 12 pack of beer. Surprise. And fucking there's 150 people there. 150 I in the house. I swear to God. Because, you know, I had that huge backyard. Lon Bronson had a band. They had a jazz band, mariachis, waiters, waitresses. We drank 75 bottles of Perrier Joey, the, the flowered bottle. 75. I mean, it's like six and a half cases. This party was rocking and rolling. They had sushi. She had waitresses, valet parking in the back. That's where all the cars were in the back. So I lived like on a desolate street. So my boss is my boss is there, and I got the luggage that you know somebody slipped me, which is weird. And then his wife whispers in my ear, "True fucking story. You'll never get another raise." Your house is nicer than ours. Swear to God. Wow. Swear to God. At the party. At your surprise at the party, party, she said that. She come and everybody's stopping by. Hello, hello. Uh, you know, I, I am truly surprised. Stunned. And did that turn out to be true? Well, listen, I built this house. I, I No, did you never get another raise? Probably not, to be honest with you. Probably, I left. Shortly after that, you know, to do the Sopranos. So you, you turned 40. When when was, how old were you when you started on the Sopranos? Uh, like, uh, I auditioned, I was probably 41. Oh, so right after, okay. Right after. But she, could you imagine saying that? Your house is nicer than ours. You're going to get another race. And the, the, the party went, I, I remember going to bed at about three. And then I woke up at six and there was still like, a dozen people? people there in the backyard drinking shit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was uh, it was good. It was good. But I don't like it. So to this day, I'm paranoid. And they'll say, where are we going to go to dinner? And I always go, uh, TBA, to be announced. I'll let you know at the last minute. Just To, to prevent a surprise happening. Correct. You don't want to ambush. No. So I always do that. I'll pick. I'll let you know, you know, by five o'clock. So they can't invite a bunch of people, you know. Uh, Lake House, Carmelo and Tony arrive. Janice is there. Bobby joins. Bobby looks ridiculous. They, now, do you wear shorts like that? That's not, not your thing. Not that short. No, I, wear short. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> not like that. No, me neither. Uh, I have those shorts somewhere. I have that tank top and I have those shorts. You Oh, the the actual the actual yeah. wardrobe from the yeah. show, and yeah. I have the I think I have the flip flops. I, I, you don't I, wear those shorts. No, 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 no. Uh, they had bought me all kinds of stuff there, and 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 Juliet let me have it. Uh, he says, "Oh, National Lampoon's vacation." Uh, Tony greets Bobby. I mean, he's spraying. What's Bobby doing? Spraying some shit. Uh, I don't know. Weed killer. Whatever he's doing there. Uh, I, you know, but he says, every time I'm up here, I got to admit, it's pretty great. They go inside. There's the baby. Tony's playing with the baby, teasing her. Yeah, she's older. That's a different kid, obviously, because we saw them, the Nika as a baby. Now she's a toddler. Yeah. Uh, he calls her Murgatroyd, which you remember, what was it, Snagglepuss or whatever, yeah. the cartoon Simmons character. Murgatroyd. Murgatroyd's actually like a British noble name. Uh, Gilbert and Gilbert and Sullivan. There's uh, characters named Murgatroyd, as well as in Agatha Christie, Agatha Christie and Virginia Woolf. Now, um, now, Tony says something. If Frank Sinatra was coming here to celebrate his birthday, would you leave the lawn like that? It looks like shit. So, where is he comparing himself to Frank Sinatra? He's supposed to do the lawn. It, now, it's right here begins to me the Soprano home movies. Because we're referring to the past, but we're also referring to the same dynamics going on in the present. The first thing is, Carmela says, can I have a Pellegrino? And Janice says, how about, how about uh, ShopRite Sparkling? Yeah. Basically saying, we you have more money than us. Exactly. It's a dig about the money. Only Janice can come up, you know, can turn something so simple into something so fucked up. You it's think just so brilliant. Between, if you put, if I put a Pellegrino or a Shoprite in front of you, would you know the difference? No, no. But she's making this point, like you know, 
I, that, that's also why I brought it up earlier. What's the agenda? Because there are, you know, there's nothing cut and dry with Janice. There's always some undercut, uh, undertone of some bitterness and scores. Interesting because she says that, and then Tony says, if Frank Sinatra was coming, he's basically saying, "I'm your boss, and you don't even fucking mow your lawn." Correct. You, it's an ego thing. You should treat me. You should think more of me. Kiss my ass. It's my birthday. You invite me here. You, this place should look fucking immaculate. That's basically what he's saying to you. And it, I think what it establishes right here, right at the beginning, the Soprano family stuff is weird, sick, fucked up, and still is. <laughs> and and then she gives this thing. Uh, he has a lof, enough lawn maintenance at the new house that somebody let the gardener go. Right. He got him the house and yeah. she's complaining that there's no like nothing is ever fucking enough. Oh, the house wasn't enough. I'm joking. You know how grateful we are. He goes and gets Tony a beer. Now, the nanny uh, uh, is played by Patrina Murray. That was her first job. Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was her first acting job. First acting she, job. She does a very good job. Yeah, she was very good. And that was her first acting job. Now, this is Lake uh, Oscarwana, it's called. Uh, it's a, like you said, it's about an hour outside New York City. Beautiful. I mean, it, there's a, in a lot of the scenes here, it looks almost fake. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, and on the lunch breaks, uh, a lot of the guys, you know, they went out on the boat and they a lot of the crew guys were swimming in the lake and stuff. And, you know, yeah. And, uh, and Phil Abraham, I have to bring him up because he was the cinematographer on this. He really makes it look absolutely gorgeous with the way he the light and the colors it's just uh he did he did a really wonderful job on this episode uh so now you're in the woods and you're shooting this ar-10 automatic rifle which was 800 rounds does that mean per minute i'm assuming i, I guess i mean i don't know nothing about guns but he says this is your gift and tony there's no way no way what do you you know you run out of your way there's none of that oh thank you He's expecting the gift. He's expecting it. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, you know, expecting. he likes kind of having the power over you. Sure, you of know? course. Uh, um, is that how you bang that deer that's hanging on right. the wall? He says, I won't use it. Bobby says, I wouldn't use a firearm like this. It's unsportsmanlike. Don't forget, from the Pine Barrens, Bobby's a hunter. He used to go up there with his father. He knows all about hunting and the gear and the guns. He's a marksman when he shot uh, the rapper in the ass, you know. So this is yeah, Bobby's and, and uh, house here. Bobby likes to do this, but also the, the uh, quality of being unsportsmanlike or sportsmanlike, because in the game later on, you want to play by the rules. Uh, he says, um, thanks, don't say shit to Carmela. So don't let Carmela know you gave me the gun. Uh, the lake house, Tony Camilla and Bobby uh, Janice, they sit by the lake, they're talking. Uh, me and Tony almost got a summer place down at the shore, remember, Tony? Whitecaps. She changes the subject immediately. He doesn't even acknowledge that and says, uh, what about the mushrooms? Stuffed mushrooms. Yeah, he and doesn't Bobby, want to go there. He, It's a sore spot, obviously a so sore spot for Tony. You know? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, Bobby explains that his father... Bought this place because it was close to Canada. He had ties in Montreal. His grandfather, I believe, right? Grandfather. His grandfather was in Montreal and came to America through Montreal illegally. Uh, didn't come like most of Italian American immigrants through Ellis Island into into New York or wherever. Um, which is an interesting point. And then he says they ought to build a wall now. What wow, build a wall to, between Canada and America is like they're. That's Bobby. You don't know what the fuck he's talking about, but uh, but but Carmelo agrees. Oh sure, well, you know Carmelo that. says yeah. Uh, you know Montreal, one of my favorite cities. You know that. I know beautiful. You know. Yeah, a lot of Italians. A lot of Italians. A great Italian restaurant in their little Italy, Inferno. Nick yeah, a great food in Montreal, man, and a great. beautiful city. You can walk there. It's, love it, it's love it. Great architecture, good people, fun that's place. Where we, that's where we shot Nicky Deuce. We had a good time up there. Yeah, really good time. Uh, 
So uh, he bought the place that was close to Canada, which in real life it's not, of course. Uh, and she says, I'm very lucky to be back with my family after all these years. Look at you and me, Tone. What would have thought that we'll have the kind of relationship we have now? The credit goes to you. You really changed. That's a fucking <laughs> backhanded compliment if I ever heard right. it. He's saying we could have had a good relationship, but you were an asshole years ago. But now you've changed and now we can have a relationship. And he gets it. And he's like, what the fuck does that mean? I'm different. How? How am I different? So there's a little, uh, you know, what am I, a clown? A little Pesci stuff. A, a little nod to Goodfellas there, right? I'm different. How? How am I different? But, you know, Janice, there's, she manages to with a compliment, have a dig. It's about, you know, she's very skilled at just manipulation and fucking Livia. Know, guilt tripping. Livia. She's Livia, yeah. You know. Maybe, she's even worse than Livia, though. Smarter version of Livia. More dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, is Bobby a right winger? Maybe. Probably. Maybe. I think most uh, of them kind of are. Gun guys and, you know, you know. Uh, and now then, then Carmelo tells the story. Tell that story you heard. The pool. I don't know. Where does this come in? Carmelo tells the story. Three-year-old drowned in a pool. Uh, a little bit of foreshadowing later in the season. AJ. A little bit. Uh, um, I can't get the story out of my head. You know, I was horrified. I had a pool uh, in Vegas. And we didn't get. I had the house. I didn't put a pool in until my daughter was five years old. Of course, Great. there's so many of those stories, you know, that, and it's not the parents' fault necessarily. They're just, you know, the phone rings or the doorbell rings. And for that split second, God forbid, the kid falls in the pool. It's horrifying. And every year, you know, you hear these stories, you know, it's just terrible. You know, and then uh, that that drove me mad, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess this is also like a um, sets a little sets up for the tension that comes later when Janice kind of flips out that the baby the is in the water yeah. and she's not looking, I guess, and control control issues and all that stuff. You see, but, uh, you see, it looks like Tony's having a, a, a fit here. I yeah. mean, this next scene, he's <laughs> shaking. I mean, yeah. Uh, Carmela is, uh, you know, giving him a little birthday treat, uh, and she comes and lies down next to him. Uh, next thing you know, Bobby's boat, it's a nice boat. Uh, and I'm really nice driving boat. that boat. Yeah. I'm driving that boat. You were driving it? I was driving the boat. You were, you were going pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. No. And we had the Heineken. I had water in mine. I think Jim had water in his. I had water in my beer can. Uh, but no, I, you know, I got to, I'm not good at this, but I, Lake Mead, uh, we used to go out and get boats all the time. So I could drive that size boat, you know. You know, I'm a terrible driver, but I could do the boat. You know, at least the, the, the first the, time. The lake got a lot of room. Yeah, the first time I went to Vancouver, it was summer. I was doing a movie. My kids were a lot, this is like 2003, my kids were a lot younger. And, you know, Vancouver is surrounded by water. It's one of the most beautiful places I've oh, been. Yeah. And I went down the marina and I rented a boat. Actually, it was bigger than that one that you drive in the show. I never drove a boat in my life. I show my driver's license. They gave you a boat. Yeah. I took this thing up, you know, in the bay, up in, the, you know, it was... One of the most beautiful things we ever did. We stopped it in the middle of this. There's nobody around and just went swimming. I mean, it was just amazing. But then when I came back, I had to get gas. And I pulled into the dock head first, which you're not supposed to do. You got to come sideways. Nobody told me anything. Yeah. You know what I was doing. <laughs> you know? And a boat is different. It doesn't, it's not like a car just stops or you turn it and it just turns. Yeah. You know? It's very, very different. But it's weird that if you have a driver's license, they'll give you a boat. Yeah, I used to go to Lake Mead all the time. Now it's Lake Mead is the, the water level is ridiculous, 20 something feet lower. There's shit, you know, they actually found the city under there. I think it's called St. John's. Actual city that the, the lake had covered. It was a city there. You could look it up. In, that they abandoned when, when they dammed it up. When they, they put when the they lake, up the, the river. water was so high, it was underneath. The water level went down. You could see the church steps, and you could see. Wow. 
I swear. didn't know that. Look it up. St. John's. It's at Lake Mead out there. I mean, we used to go to the marina. They had a restaurant. They had a bar. Uh, you know, we used to go quite often. Isn't now, it we, dangerous swimming there? Like, well, Lake Mead? Any, That's what any, I heard. Any lake side, because they have those, you know, the, the kind of the sinkholes. And I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that now. We used to jump off and uh, swim. It was very popular. It still is, but not because it goes, you know, you could take the boat all the way to Colorado and all that. I would just go around the lake for a few hours. So, yeah. uh, so nice. what, the water level dropped because of a, a, a drought? That, that kind of drought. thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. St. Thomas. Saint, it's called St. Thomas, not St. John's. Underneath Lake Mead, when, the, when it dropped, you could see the city underneath there. It's incredible. Amazing. Uh, Carmella, uh, Lake House, Carmella calls AJ. He's lying in their bed. Uh, He's in their bed with his girlfriend. Yeah. Hey, That's saying, what happens when you leave the house. Hey, he's in a bed. He's living large. She likes the jacuzzi. I mean, she got they got this big house to themselves for the weekend. Uh, Her nan and the friends come. They're going to have a pool party. Here's something that's Fran the waitress. We're busy down here. I'm at work at the pizzeria. He's lying he's just like his father. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know why. Well, listen, I guess I would have did it too. Got the nice big bed. They're living. They're playing house. Friends coming over. Uh, lake house. Carmela and Janice are in the kitchen. Uh, Tony seems to hit the, uh, the Tony seemed to hit the hooch a little at lunch today. I think he's feeling his age, Carmela says. When we kids would do uh, whatever I said. He ate one of Tippy's milk bones because I told him it was a cookie. Right. She's the older sister, and he looked up to her. You know? My therapist she, said anything. She said Ma was a splitter. She pit the three of us against each other. Uh, I couldn't right. help and you. And she know. says... She did it to toughen us up, which is a lie. She did it because she was a sick fuck, basically. Yeah, and people. Have you that. known splitters? Have you known anyone like that? I think my mother was somewhat of a splitter. That's splitter. why I asked David about it, honestly, because she. There's five kids, and uh, it kind of pitted one against another. You know, didn't go like you know. Uh, try to get everyone together, be harmonious. Never. Oh, well, get along with your sister. Get along with your brother. Never did that. Kind of, you know, would talk about one to the other, to the other. You know what That's your really said? bad. You know what That's your sister really said? Bad. She she would say to me, you know what your sister said? So now I'm mad at her. You know, whereas like with my two daughters and their best of friends, but even when they would argue when they were younger, I would go, no, 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 no. We're not having that. You're not, you're not, you know, you're not going to fight with each other. You're not going to yell at each other. No, 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 no. You know, I would step of in. Of course. I would do it to this day and they're grown women now. Sure. I would go, no, you, splitting is horrible parenting. You make it right with your sister. You make it right with your brother. That's the way it should be. So my mother was, which is why I asked David about it, because it's the first time I have had ever heard that term. You know. Uh, yeah, and then she says, uh, Ma, Livia, couldn't stand when the kids talked and expressed ideas. You know, she was afraid it would get us in trouble. It wasn't that she didn't love us, which, again, is bullshit. It's oh, denial. Thick, and thick, Carmella thick, looks thick at her denial. like that, knowing it's bullshit. Uh, you know, uh, she looks at Janice like, hmm, yeah. Uh, and Janice says, Sandy said, you know, Sandy is the wacko. The wacko therapist. therapist that she has, you know, the crazy therapist. So look who she's getting advice from. Bobby's a boat on the lake. Tony and Bobby fish on the lake. It looks like we're in the middle of the lake, but we're right off the top. By the shore? The way they shot it. Right on the top. Oh, really? Right there. Never never would know. The way they shot it, it looks like we're right in the middle, you know. And, uh, you know, Tony's saying you've been a solid performer for some time. You get older. Think about things. Uh, he says, you know, I had uh, somebody in mind for something, meaning Christopher. And now he's thinking about Bobby for it. Yeah, he's saying we have diverging agendas. Part of that, obviously, is Juliana. And then he talks about this windows in the projects. He wants Bacala to do it. He's talking about long-term, almost refers to the long-term parking a little bit. 
But he also brings up being the boss, 80% chance. I always felt 80% chance you wind up in jail or dead, but no risk, no reward. Uh, and, and then Bacala says something very interesting here. You probably don't even hear it when it happens, which a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people have, have kind of read into this as, you know, kind of being foreshadowing of the finale, yeah. the last scene of The Sopranos. Yeah, he people, brings it up, you never pop your cherry, but yeah. yet your dad was the Terminator. And now it comes out that your uh, that Bacala Sr., played by uh, Bert Young, was a barber. I didn't know. Yeah, and he says, uh, you know, my father never wanted it for me. You know, Bobby says, I, you know, I've done stuff. I've never done that. Uh, he says, you know, sometimes my, my pop uh, said he would have just cut hair and stayed in the shop instead, just live a normal life. And he says, I would have ra <laughs> I'd rather be shot uh, than him cut my hair. You know, and uh, he tells him there's somebody I've been bringing along to insulate myself uh, that could bring down a boss and take care of Carmela too, in case, God forbid, now maybe between me and this person, there's diverging agendas, meaning Christopher. Thing is, the new faci Newark facilities manager, he's going to fix it so we do all the window replacements in the project. Maybe you should do that work, and we'll see what happens after that long term. Uh, and Bobby says, you know, DNA now and big fat pain in the balls about uh, killing someone. Talking about a heavy subject here. There's one thing. Yeah, about, and also foreshadowing what's going to happen. Yeah, on this there's one thing about beating someone up, threatening someone, beating, and another thing about uh, killing it's someone. About murder, but, but, uh, Ironically, this is exactly what we're going to see later on. Lake House, they're singing happy birthday. They've been drinking. Uh, Tony blows out the candles. Uh, time for the presents. Now, we sang happy birthday, and, you know, they had to go around the table, get the four of us, different angles, you know, the whole strip. So we sang it 20, 25 times. Yeah. And there's a guy across the lake. All right, he goes. All right, I get it. It's your birthday. Shut the fuck up already. <laughs> oh, like someone who lived there. Yeah, somebody lived there. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. That across sure. Because <laughs> he's been hearing it for hours. It was very funny, and you could hear a pin drop out there. And this was well, people time. don't realize how you know, like a lot of people always want to come to the set. They want to see you come to the set is usually the most boring thing you can. Yeah. It's like like watching paint dry. You'll see someone get out of a car and say hello, you know, for four hours. You know, uh, I mean, it's just like, no. yeah, it's yeah. not exciting. And, and and you know, the sets usually uh, you know, warehouses and shit, and you know, people think it's. Uh it's not the roof, on the roof by a river at four in the morning in the in the yeah. middle of the winter time. They're, they're, they're not. Uh, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. It's not. It's very boring. No. Right, you know, uh, she gives speak, him uh, a big set of fancy golf clubs. You don't play golf, right? You never. No, play. never. I've never no. golfed in my life. I neither have I. Uh, no, never, no, I have no desire to. No other way. Uh, Tony makes a toast. He's grateful for this moment, grateful for family. How soon all that just goes down the fucking toilet. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the golf club she gives, hence the title, Soprano Home Movies. She had their uh, the home movies from Super 8s uh, transferred over to, I guess, VHS DVD. at the time, DVD. DVD. DVD yeah. and, uh, which is a nice gift. A lot of people do yeah. that now. Uh, you know, you have some good memories there. You know, we had, uh, when I was a kid, we had a movie projector. You know, I mean, a movie yeah. camera with the projector. My father uh, hocked it. My father hocked it. I swear to God. Got the movie projector when I was very, very young. And uh, I, remember, I remember, actually, I remember watching that. And and he hocked the fucking screen and the thing. Uh, they sing karaoke. Now, uh, do you do karaoke? What's your go-to song? The only time I did karaoke was at Brad Gray's house. The night before the Emmys, it was me, 
uh, Tony Sirico, Vince, and uh, Jim, and we sang I Got You, Babe. Do you remember that? I do remember it, yeah. The four of us got up there. It was very funny. And we sang I Got You, Babe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a picture of that in our book, in our book coming out. I did it one uh, a long time ago. My uh, go- uh, ex girlfriend and I went to London to visit Tracy Ullman and her family. We we both had worked with Tracy and stayed with them in London and did karaoke with her and her family. One of the funniest things ever. It's fun. <laughs> did she have a big uh, big house? They had a nice townhouse near Hyde Park, um, but she was just uh, kind of hilarious. And her husband, uh, Alan, uh, was, was a very good guy, was the worst at karaoke, at, at, you know, just completely tone deaf, had no sense of rhythm or phrasing or anything. But uh, did you know that? And I think they did. I think they did. I got you, babe, that night. That's funny. That's funny. But... You know, listen, karaoke is a big thing at parties, obviously. And do you have, especially like in Koreatown here, you know. Oh, it's huge. You know, you go there, you rent a room, right? Or you have a minimum, you're going to spend the grand or whatever it is. And you have it private. You order drinks. Yeah. You have your room and and that's a good time. I mean, it's not for me, but some people... Some people take it very serious. They're not fucking very around. Very serious. They have yeah, these karaoke I can't stand nights. Karaoke. We used to have one uh, in the lounge at the Riviera, like on an off night, and people would sign up, and they're very serious. This ain't drunk oh, yeah. people in a bar, you know. And this is where, when they were singing karaoke, uh, Edie and Aida, uh, that's where Jim started Going, mommy wants chicken salad. Mommy wants chicken salad. Because oh, earlier, that was this. Yeah, because uh, earlier in the day or the day before, Aida, which we've talked about, she wanted no carbs, and she she had to eat at certain intervals because of her own uh, health yeah. issues. Yeah. So she was going, mommy wants chicken salad. She talked to this third in the third person. Mommy wants chicken salad. Mommy wants chicken salad. So she was yelling that. And then that night, Jim was fucking around, and he was talking like a parrot. Mommy wants chicken salad. Mommy wants well, now, do you think part of that was staying a little bit in the dynamic of the scenes and the relationships? I think he That's was, very much what Tony would do to, uh, I think to he Janet. Was just breaking her balls. And they were laughing, and Edie was like, I don't know. And she know got pissed. Yeah. Aida got pissed and walked out. And and was fucking mad. And uh, Tim Van Patten, uh, you know, went after her. And then Jim looked at me and he went, I think I was a little out of line. I, you think I should apologize? And he said, I think you should. It's very much the scenes. <laughs> Aida, uh, Janice sings Out of Time by the Stones. Carmela does Love Hurts by Nazareth. And, and uh, Edie is so great because she could sing, I think, in real life, and she was terrible here. She and she looks like she's having a really good time. And and uh, Aida sings nice. Aida got a real uh, a good voice, you know. No. Uh, uh, you know, and then uh, then they start playing Monopoly. Yeah, it cuts to the song called "Killer Joe" by the Rocky Fellers, which was a Filipino-born uh, group of four brothers, sixties pop, pop group. Now they start playing Monopoly, and free parking now. Free parking in the rule book, Bobby's right, me is nothing. It's just a free resting space. But house rules differ from place to place. Some people put money when you have a, a fine, you put the money in there, or you just put five hundred bucks, and if you land, it's like a bonus. Bobby doesn't like this. Bobby says, "Listen, the Parker brothers took the time to think this out. He shows the rules, and Janet goes, fuuck the Parker brothers, just play the game." Uh, Tony, free parking. This is bullshit. You take a game of skill. You make it all about luck. How about I make up my own fucking rules? Bobby's getting his balls twisted. He's drunk. And they're drinking oh. gin, vodka, grappa. They're mixing. And we Cognac. all know. And they started early. And it's getting late. 
And now, we Parker all- Brothers did not invent Monopoly. You know, it was invented in 1903 by a woman, Lizzie Maggie. It was called The Landlord's Game. It was an educational tool to illustrate negative aspects of concentrating land in monopolies, believe it or not. This guy, Charles Darrow, played the game, took the rules, and then made his own version of that which he called Monopoly, and he brought it to Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers realized he stole it, and they bought the rights for 500 bucks from this Maggie, Lizzie Maggie. Wow. At the Forbes Museum in New York, they have some of the prototype Monopoly boards that this guy made. They're made out of cloth, and they're round, and they're like hand-drawn and stuff. Oh, There's wow. some of the original ones. It's pretty cool to see. But in 1941, this is really interesting, British intelligence had the game the british they had british versions of monopoly in the 40s they had the game manufacturer make special editions which they had these fake charity groups bring to english pow's in nazi camps hidden inside the games were maps compasses and real money for the prisoners to use to escape wow yeah i didn't know that man i just heard about that it's pretty fucking wild Wow. You know, I've never, I mean, I haven't played Monopoly in years, but I've never finished a game. Like when we were kids, I've oh, never, we used to play it all the time. All the way through? Oh, yeah. yeah. We used to play Mike Friends, like in, in Mount Vernon, when we were teenagers, preteens and teenagers, all the time. Like we play for hours. Really? It was the big thing, yeah. Yeah, we. I, I don't think I've ever finished all the way through. So the four of them are very drunk. They're drinking, you know, you're mixing, you know how that goes. One thing you can't do is fucking mix. You're drinking something all night, and you know what I mean? I tell you, everybody looks really drunk. I mean, the acting here is excellent but on everybody's part. You know, when um, we got to the part where in the snifter, Jim, I don't know if Jim had a few drinks, but Jim told me, he said, uh, you know, they put some in my glass, Anthony, the prop guy. But um, it wasn't when you were going to fight. No, 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 no. Because no. the fight later, I'll tell that story later. Right. But before right. I was smelling it, the smelling the, the real stuff, uh, Remy or whatever it was, uh, I can't drink and work. I personally cannot. I know some people can, some people like it. I cannot. But... You know, he suggested, you know, get the feel of it, you know. And, you know, so I was doing some of that. We look drunk, the four of us, most certainly. Nobody's drinking, you know. No. I mean, there was too much. We were doing that for hours and hours. We hours. did that for, that was two days, the, the Monopoly. Sure. You know, that was a lot of shit, right? That wasn't just done in two hours and out, right? So she tells the story about her father, uh, that Livia's going on and on and on. And uh, the father shoots the bullet through her bouffant. And Tony doesn't like it. Says it makes the family look bad. It makes us look like uh, we're a dysfunctional Dys- family. <laughs> Which is pretty much the case. The I liked also how he said when you say, uh, uh, how about I make my own rules? And he goes, how about that? How about that? He starts acting like a parrot. That's parrot. why I said maybe he's... Because he was at, you know. Maybe he was, but I, you know, he was just doing it to fuck around, you know. Uh, and uh, she mentions the milk bone, which he didn't know. No. So Tony's getting pissed and he's drunk. Uh, Carmela's drunk. Carmela is liking that story uh, that he shot the gun through the bouffant. Next day she had a bob, like nothing ever happened. I mean, that's pretty crazy showing the, the hair. But they really used, crazy. They yeah. used to wear the big hair like uh, March. Yeah. <laughs> like Paulie Walnuts. Right? Uh, and then, you know, Tony's singing under the boardwalk, you know. Uh, she lands on boardwalk. She says, I own it. And he says, you blue guys under it, which is really mean and below the belt. You know, uh, he says, uh, hey, Tony, then he's, you know, Tony's going, uh, under the boardwalk with his schlong and Janice mouth. Bobby gives him a dirty look. Bobby warns him. Well, he also says, you second prize in a beauty contest. Yeah, you lost to a German shepherd shaved asshole, which is already stepping over the line. Really insulting. And, and uh, you know, Bobby also says, you know, you Sopranos, you go too far. 
you know, Bobby is not happy. Bobby's very drunk. We never seen him like this. He's very no, drunk. he's right. I mean, it's like it's one thing to bust balls and another thing to really make disgusting, you know, exactly. sexual no, stuff. Sister or really no sister, he's out of line here. That, well, you, she says he starts singing under the boardwalk, saying Jan with a, with a slung in Jan's mouth, and you hit him. Yeah. And which so, begins one of the best, most real, scariest fights I think I've ever seen on film. I mean, a TV show or a movie. It's fantastic. It's not, very not, real, and it's really exciting and dangerous. We started this episode in July 2006, okay? We went up to that lake house. We went to do the fight scene, and Jim had gotten operated on his knees. We were there with the stunt guys, and he said, I can't do this the right way, okay? So we did all the lake house stuff at the lake house. Six months later, in January of 2007, they rebuild that lake house on the soundstage in Long Island City, New York, Silver Cup. It's scary. It's built to a T. Yeah. When you walked on the set, it was scary. It was like, where the fuck am I, right? Uh, Amazing. And they built it. And, uh, you know, Jim had said, you know, talked about it. He said, let's make this as real as we can. We're good friends. Let's go as far as we can. And you know that's how he worked. He don't mind if you slapped him or choked him or pulled his hair, you know. There was one th- one note that I got. There was one thing that during the fight, uh, you know, Carmella jumps on Tony's back to pull him off. They had to make sure that that wasn't like she was holding him back and Bobby hit him. You know what I mean? That it looked like because of her, that's why he lost the fight. Right. No, and that that never did seem yeah. like that. So, you know, we, we, we do the fight. Uh, you know, two kind of out of shape guys. Jim's much stronger than me, much bigger than me, bigger hands than me. I mean, he's choking you. You feel it choking. The chain was cutting into my neck. Uh, it took us a day and a half to do that. Jesus. A day really? and a half. And it just was working on that. Just working on that. Just a, a fight, a, a day and a half. Oh. Uh, you know, it was first me and Jim, and then Aida and, uh, you know, Janice came later on, you know, uh, when with that, the jumping on and all that. And we did, it's almost all of us, completely us, not the stunt guy. They're there, but it's almost all of us you know, me and Jim, at one point, at one point, you know, it was a choreographed. I was supposed to headbutt him. He didn't move out of the way. And I hit him and he went down. I mean, down. So you came and he was supposed to move his head. Yeah, it was like this. Sidewalk. And I was supposed to go boom. And he was supposed to move out of the way. But I hit him in the nose. You could hear the cartilage crack. You could actually hear it. I thought Did it, it break. The nose. No, it was the cartilage. So we took Just a break. Badly bruised. Yeah, we took a break for about an hour, hour and a half. And then he came back and we did it. He went to the hospital afterwards. And it was just the cartilage broken. The next day we had about a half a day's work. I was sore as hell. Sore as hell the next day. I mean, I I never haven't gotten that physical in so long. Yeah, that stuff makes you really sore. You know, it was crazy. I think that's why the fight looked good. Like I said, that's the way guys fight. They don't. You know, you punch. It's punch. not like a, it. It's re, that's why it's so effective because it looks real. It's not just like this. You know, like they did in the westerns or on Batman it's or something. Steven Seagal. You know. That's how his movies are, right? Yeah. They wait, they run in. Uh, if, I love the detail of the house, the monop- green Monopoly house stuck to Jim's face when it's on the floor. It's hilarious. I fun. mean, that little detail. I thought, and David, I remember th- cracking up at that. He wanted that. That was funny. The motel, right? Yeah. So Bobby's out of his mind, you know what I mean? Janice, he, Bobby's stunned, right? Janice, Carmelo is screaming. Uh, Bobby goes to leave, jumps in the car, drunk. Yeah, really very drunk. drunk, and he backs up into the tree. I remember doing that. Uh, I backed up a few times, but then the stunt guy did that. 
Because you could get fucked up with that. You got to know what you're doing. Oh, you got to be really careful. Uh, Janice is flipping out because she knows the repercussions. She knows. It's not just my husband and my brother fighting. She knows it's the boss getting beat up, which is a whole can of worms that she's very aware of. Yeah. And uh, he comes back in and Bobby apologizes. Tone, you know. uh, uh, He beat him up bad. He beat Tony up bad. Tony's hurt, man. I, you know, people, uh, I say he's going to suck a punch. I, I don't know. He was facing him. He was facing him. Not only that, he just said something really vile and insulting about his wife. About you the should be expecting time. something, some kind of retaliation. It wasn't like you just walked up to a guy randomly and hit him in the face. He's saying that to save face, Tony. Of course, you know, and he's beat up bad. Uh Right? Oh, yeah. He's beat up really bad, you know. Uh, he puts, uh, Carmella puts him to bed, right? Goes sleep in the other room. Uh, and, and and he says to, uh, you know, I was defending you. you Bacala says that to Janice. She says, I'm a big girl. I can take care of myself. Care of myself. He's the head of the family. You think he's going to forget about this in the morning? At 4.04 a.m., he wakes up very drunk. They're all hungover. They must feel like shit. Now he's hurt, beaten, and and hungover. He goes into Bobby and Janice's room. What the fuck are you doing? He's slurring. You beat me fair and squash. I remember him saying that when we did it. You beat me fair and squash. Right, but then he doesn't really believe that later. No. And uh, Bobby, come on. Let's just forget about it. We shut that in the middle of the afternoon. Remember, I was teasing Aida, breaking up the balls. We were like in the back, <laughs> laughing. Uh, the morning, uh, Bobby's throwing bottles in the trash. He wakes Tony up. Uh, you know, come on, Carmelo says, I'm packed. I would like to go. You were right. He you says, you me. should have insisted on me not drinking, he says to Carmela. And she says, oh, so he's deflecting blame, deflecting the you know fault. Now it's my fault. They're getting ready to leave. Janice has just made a frittata. Bobby's making Ramos fizzes, which is gin with egg whites and lemon juice. Uh, Tony and Carmel says we're leaving. And, and, and you guys are saying, well, we're family. These things happen. They don't really happen, no, <laughs> which is no. not really the case. <laughs> These things happen. We're family. Uh, we all had a little too much to drink. No harm done. The whole thing's already forgotten. It's not for Bobby to decide if it's forgotten. No, it's not. And then Bobby says, have a drink. Hair of the dog. You know where this the expression hair of the dog comes from? No. Uh, hundreds of years ago, I think in like Scotland, apparently, if you get bit by a rabid dog, they had a belief that if you put hair from the dog that bit you in the wound, that it would heal the rabies. Really? Did it work? That's where that comes from. I don't think there's any science to that. Uh- but... Like curing like, which is which homeopathy is based on. It's hair of the dog. So you're drinking to cure the hangover, which you got from drinking. You know, I got to tell you, uh, I don't believe in that. Uh, I've done it a few times years ago. You know, you're so hungover, you start drinking again. Like the it helps day. a little bit. Oh, uh, you know what I used to like? Uh, sangrita, uh, tequila. And then, like, tomato juice, or clam juice, you know, tomato, clam juice. Bloody Caesar. Yeah, kind of like that. I would drink that. Or uh, Heineken, red beers, Heineken with tomato juice. I don't like that. Yeah. I like Bloody, I, I used to like Bloody Mary's, especially if you're hungover Sunday morning. That's not Yeah, bad. but then you're just going to go right back into it all day. It's not like you have two. Now I have fucking 14 Bloody Marys. And I'm drunk again <laughs> What do I do the next day? <laughs> you know uh, exactly what you're doing the next day. <laughs> Keep drinking. Basically. Uh, Bobby's saying, come on, we have that thing with the Canucks. They're, Bobby and Janice, uh, you know, they're talking them into it. Carmela's pissed. Uh, you know. And they're talking them, oh, come on, don't leave on this note. They figure if they let them stay, right? You know, uh Tony sits down by the lake. He's staring at the water, the boat. Ducks fly by. Tony's the ducks fly happy. by. Interesting. He's ruminating. He's, th- he's angry. What? He's ruminating. He's sitting there. He's, think- he's angry. 
He's angry at what happened. He's embarrassed. He's he's thinking about his mortality. He's aging. He's not the man he used to be strength wise. He was injured. He was in a coma. He is the boss. This magic moment by Benny King and the Drifters comes on and is quickly interrupted by a suicide car bombing in Iraq. Interesting moment. Uh Janice, fucking look at him out there. I've been, uh, I've seen that sitting in the chair thing. Bobby, uh, come on, I, you know, he's changing the channels. Come on, people sit in chairs. Tony sits by the lake. Carmelo arrives. Uh, if that fucking throw rug hadn't been there, it would have been Bobby on his back, not me. He's trying to explain this. Even I, I, he lost. Insecure. Even this insecure, big mom, yes. insecure. Uh, you were there that night in the crowd. He brings up in high school, the parking lot at the Pizza World. Uh, when I took yeah. Dominic Tedesco, I, I don't even know your name, but I remember our eyes met. You were blown away. She says, I was in fucking high school. I was supposed to be turned on by you beating up your brother-in-law uh, at your 47th birthday. How old's Bobby? 42, 43. In real life, I'm four years older than Jim. Four years older. Yeah. And he says those four years, as Bobby's supposed to be younger than Tony, makes a big difference. He's he's looking for any excuse on why he Bobby got the better of him. And then he says he brings up Johnny Sachs mansion. Everybody forgets what I did. You know, it's just like he was wrong. Well, she tells him you had it coming. You got away with you get away with murder because you're his boss. Listen, Bobby's always the fat jokes. They he tortures Bobby. He breaks his balls constantly. You know, that's from the beginning of the show, right? Sure. Uh, Jesus, they're grateful, she says. You know, I'm all calm. My body suffered a trauma that will probably never recover again. So why don't we just face the facts? Christopher calls Tony. He picks up. He hangs up on him. Horrible you know? timing. Christopher, Christopher has really bad timing with Tony, always. <laughs> he's always late or he's just... any. What's funny is Chris is kind of upbeat, kind of, you know, Chris kind of thinks Tony's just going to accept anything he does. He's so deluded. Hey, T, I just want to wish you a belated happy birthday, you know, oblivious to the fact that Tony is really fed up with him and his enemy. Yeah, but it's also bad timing. This was a bad time to call. Maybe if he would have called really bad. two days before. Uh, and Carmelo's complaining. Uh, they didn't come back to look at the spec house, Meadows home studying. Uh, pediatricians, not the highest paid doctors, radiologists are very materialistic, is Carmela. Very. Well, and very she's worried about the, the Verona couple. They don't want to buy the house. They're not coming back to see the house. She's all, you know, Tony's going through this kind of facing mortality, aging, you know, humi you know, being the boss, humiliate, whatever it is. And she's he doesn't really want to hear this kind of domestic inconveniences. Tony puts the golf clubs into the trunk. Uh, Nika and Mercedes are singing. Tony's They're singing Four Little Duck. Yeah, and he's got a scowl on his face. Really, really in a bad way. Tony's in a bad way here, you know? All right. And the ducks. He has, saw the duck with him when he's sitting ruminating on the pier, and now they're singing about ducks and making this point about Tony and the family and all that stuff. Um, uh, Carmela. The lake house, Tony, Camilla, Bobby, they're eating at the picnic table. And uh, Tony brings it up. i tell you something, Bobby. We had this little tussle a year ago before my injury. Carmella, this again. Tone, I think, you know, Bobby wants to put her to bed. I think everyone knows that you're at a disadvantage. I don't want to take nothing away from you but a sucker punch, a sucker punch. Bobby comes back at him here. So then it wasn't fair and square. Make up your mind. Bacala got some ballsy. Bobby's not, you know, Bobby's standing up for himself. You know what's uh, what, what's kind of cool? Bobby brings up, we found a snakehead. Uh, they thought it was a snakehead, right? A snakehead is a type of fish. Uh, the danger of a snakehead in a lake, in an ecosystem, is that it can outcompete and eventually displace established predatory species in the same habitat. Exactly what Tony is feeling towards Bobby. In that moment, uh -huh. how it, how uh, thought out these little details are by the writers. In this incredible. Sentence. Just incredible. Yeah. Uh, if you don't think that David and 
Terry and Matt are, are, are kind of geniuses. It's yeah, and yourself how thorough, and yourself included. How you can connect the dots? Yeah, it's really something. Uh, you know, Bobby. Uh, you know, uh, they're sitting there. Come on, Bobby. Let's go play some golf with some people, and they get nervous. Carmela, why don't you just hit it in the lake? Uh, Janice doesn't want him to go. They think he's going to kill him. They think that. And so Tony's does Bobby. Gonna, they think he's going to go. That Tony is going to kill Bobby. They're afraid that he won't come back. Now, you know, we're in the car here. There was a scene that got cut out. I did not see it, but Bobby's pissing with one of those wizenators in the car. No, no, on the side of we pull over and he's pissing. Oh, you use the wizardry to pretend to piss. I yeah. thought it was some device you pee no, in if you're in a car. No, but no. you're actually, he talks about I got to take a piss, but we actually did it. They just cut that second. They cut it off. out. Uh, but what's, what's funny is he says, Tony says to him, because Tony knows Bobby's scared. He's doing this on purpose sure. to make you feel scared. And he says, you want me to put the air on? It's fucking August. It must be hot. He's making it hot for you, so you sweat more, right? And you can see Bacala oh. sweating. I, they put uh, tissue in my mouth to make it look swollen, you know, the left side there. Uh, yeah. The lake, Carmela and Nika are in the lake. Mercedes watches. Janice arrives. Uh, she goes off on Mercedes. You're supposed to tell me when you take her in the lake. Carmela says, I'm here. It's okay. I don't want Anika going in the lake without my knowing. No. And now Janice overreacts. Overreacts? You have no right to feel mad. I'll give you something to be mad about. You're going to bed. You know, it's like this. I crazy. Mean, crazy. Crazy. She blames Bobby Jr. Like, uh, what's uh, the name? Uh, whatever. What's the Joan Crawford? Mommy Dearest. Yeah, Mommy Dearest. That's what I mean. That's what she's I, just she's a terror. I mean, terror. then she says, my father, you know, she talks about brings up Johnny Soprano with the shooting through the beehive. He had he was the true Nabili Don. And then she brings up my boyfriend hit me once. And then she says, I'm more like my dad than Tony. She's basically she's not saying what happened, but really. She's getting very emotional and, you know, she's. And Carmela calls her on it, the verbal diarrhea. When, when you got something in that head of yours, well, what are you saying about my husband? It's very defensive. Carmela's not going to let Janice talk shit about Tony, no matter how, if she thinks he's right or wrong. You know, uh, I don't know what goes on in your house, but for your information, Tony has never raised his hand to the children. Uh, he says, oh, let me get that. Once he slapped AJ, he felt horrible about it. And she says, Bobby took advantage of him last night when Tony had too much to drink. There's no excuse for the way Bobby blindsided him. Tony is not a vindictive man. Of course he is. Of course he is. And then Janice is like, what did I say? Well, whatever she says, she causes a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she blamed said. Bobby Jr. for Nika's uh, attitude. Problem. Right. That's you know, nice. uh, so we meet with the Canadians. That's a real bar up there. These guys was that good. was that bar upstate New York or was it in Jersey? Uh, in Jersey. In Jersey, yeah. In Jersey, I read that it was. What? It might have been in Queens. In Queens, okay. it might have been in Queens. Uh, these guys were, were really good. These French, these these French Canadians, excellent, great very little good. detail characters. Yeah. yeah, very good, very very good. Uh, they spoke perfect English. They were very good. You know, and he explains, I can't come next week. My sister, they're, they're expired, 20,000 pills every three weeks. Bobby says. So they're saying 50 grand. They were going to have to lay out 50 grand for a three-month supply. And then he brings up this, you know, his, uh, his sister's ex-husband's being a jerk and not letting the sister see the kid. Tony basically offers to do this hit for 15 grand. So he's going to knock 15 grand. Oh, I did the math here. A little bit of an allusion to Janice, though, right? Because Janice wasn't, uh, she was married or was had Harpo with some French Canadian guy from Montreal. Yeah. And she didn't see her son for a long time. He now, said, well, what kind of person, you know? Supposedly, Harpo still lives in Montreal. 
Right. He's homeless. Right. There were theories that this was Harpo's father or something like that. I, I, no, not or Harpo himself. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, baby. Listen, I, I I have to believe your theories because this is my theory. I've been this, wrong. Somebody made a connection to Harpo. Was this no uh, the Harpo would be how old? Like twenty or something, or teenager? I'm not really sure. I think he'd be a little older. No, older. Yeah. But basically, here, Tony, they, the guys leave, and Tony says, "You'll take care of this." Well, right? but this was Tony's 47th birthday. Janice is older. Uh, what is she? 49, 50? Right, maybe. You know, uh, so that guy couldn't be Harpo's father. He's too young. The guy, the guy that Bobby kills, that doesn't add up. Yeah, Bobby. Uh, you know, uh, and so Tony. Offers it to him, and the guy says, what? You're going to get a drug addict? He says, oh, no. Somebody reliable, they go to talk about it. And uh, he lays it on Bobby. You're going to take care of this, right? No bow and arrows, which is what Bobby says he's been hunting with. And Bobby, And let me ask you this. Stunned. If, if, if Tony and Bobby didn't have the fight last night, would Tony have asked Bobby to do this job? I don't think so at all. They would have got somebody to come up and do it. They got Christopher to do it. He could have got Benny, probably Benny, you know. Benny uh, or somebody. Little yeah. Polly, somebody like that would have did it now. Well, you know? uh, uh, yeah. You know, Benny seems to be doing that kind of work these days. He would have said, go up there and take care of this. Uh, he stunned Bobby. And on the way back, he is not happy. Pretty shitty thing. Uh that Tony did here, you know. That's a heavy thing. And you can't say no. You can't say no to this. You don't have an op- you don't have an option. If he does, if Bobby don't do it, Tony will kill Bobby. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Tony and Bobby drive back to the lake house. Uh, they come running out is because Bobby's alive. How was the game? Oh, if you're very smart of you, she says. Uh, you let him win. You know they're very happy to see Bobby back. Uh, you know, then Tony and Carmelo, mentioned, they pack up the car. Bobby and they, Tony they mentioned the movie, the whole movie. You see, Aunt Gemma, she was such a beauty before the steroids. Another great little soprano. <laughs> Bobby packs his bag. Janice pops up. He broke your balls about the fight, didn't he? No, he didn't. Uh, and where are you going? He packs up some stuff in a bag. It's business, and he's had enough. He don't want to go. He don't want to do this. She's breaking his balls that they got friends coming for the weekend. And he snaps at him, maybe for the first time. Stop breaking my balls. Stop nagging me. I'll be back as soon as I can. Uh, the apartment complex, that was in... Brooklyn, right? It was in Brooklyn. Is either Flatbush or... Fort Green? Around there. Somewhere yeah. in that area, you know. It looks like Montreal. They have those kind of house uh, apartments over there. Yeah. Like that. Uh, the laundry room. You Great know, scene. Bobby, I like the way this was done. Bobby looks at the picture. He sees the guy with the laundry. The girl, uh, she's one of the leads of an ABC show, A Million Little Things. Which girl? The one in the picture or the one who's in the laundromat? The girl that's in the laundromat. So you, she just says one word. I think she says hello to him in French. She's yeah. now one of the stars of this big ABC show, One Hour Drop. Which one? Uh, it's called A Million Little Things. It's a good show. Oh, yeah, yeah. I watch yeah. it. It's uh, Stephanie Solstak. I don't know. Uh, very good. She's uh, one of the leads. It's something. There she had literally one word. One word. She says hello. And now she's the star. She's been working steady and is uh, one of the leads of this ABC show. Hey, most of us start with very humble beginnings. In yeah, got to start somewhere, right? Start uh, somewhere. So Bobby comes in. He looks at him. The, the guy did a great job, Brene. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't have any lines. He was great. But very believable. Very believable. Bobby comes in. He shoots him. Gets close to shoot him in the head. Now, the shirt wasn't supposed to rip. That just happened. Oh, really? Great that detail. That, that was a happy accident. 
He grabs, and he wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let go. And Bobby pulls away, and the T-shirt ripped. That was just. But it, I believed it because the death grip, right? Yeah, people say in the, the moment of death they can have that happened. grip. Just happened. Um, you know, despite Bobby never have doing, uh, ha, never have done this, he certainly looks like he knows what he's doing. I mean, we know he's good with guns. He he, yeah. he likes guns. He can handle a gun. But the courage, the deliberate, the, you know, being deliberate, the you know, just ma- you know, just kind of mechanical. You know, you he's supposed to do his face. job. I'm horrified when the guy grabs- he's horrified, but he does it right. Yeah, but the look on his face, he's he's horrified. Uh, it was a great shot of the the window on the dryer shattering too. That, that was, was CGI. Really cool. CGI. No, that was great. Uh, Soprano House, Tony's watching the whole movies. Neil Mink, his attorney, calls the gun charge. It's not going away. Essex County did, but it looks like the feds took it over. Uh, Tony says, what happened? It was a piece of shit case. It's unwinnable, but folded into a RICO. It is a predicate. If they had what they needed, we'd be having this conversation through glass. He's watching the whole movies Janice gave, uh, gave him. Uh, and he got a little smile on his face. He's watching him and Janice's kids. Uh, the lake house. To the lake house. This magic moment, which we heard a little bit of before, we hear again. Everything I want, I have. Whenever I hold you tight, we see Bobby and his kids holding uh, his girl. But now he's a killer. He was not the day before, and now and he is. Life will never be the same. He knows that. So this episode ends kind of a touching, idyllic scene with a lot of foreboding and a lot of clouds on the horizon. Without you know, he did something they didn't want to do. They shot a beautiful uh, yeah, Janice, lovely Janice's hair in the background and beautiful his, Phil Phil Abraham, great yeah, DP. He did, he did a great job. Phil also, which we talked about uh, when we were on location, Phil got very drunk. Well, okay. didn't the director Tim Van Patten was pretending to do shots with Phil of yeah. tequila, and Tim was doing water, and Phil was going head to head and was doing tequila, and poor, paid the price. Poor of Phil, that. poor Phil, poor Phil. Now it's time for the Tony Soprano's Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our AMA Best Question is Jeremy from Ontario, Canada, and we're going to send Jeremy a pair of Bose headphones. Jeremy asked, if you were teaching an acting class, what lessons and principles would you impart on your students? Never had one of those. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, you know, I taught an acting class. Actually, it was at the theater we had, Studio Dante. It, it was four teachers. It was Vince Curtola, Nick Sandow, Sharon Angel, myself. Um, you know, what I tried to do as a teacher was to kind of teach the students how to use themselves. Um, start with your, Start with what you feel you and your what you feel is common what you share with the character you know what i mean so you can relate with some reality instead of just trying to be something you're not to start with yourself you may have to add a limp you may have to add an accent you may have to be older than you are but first you start with yourself how do i relate to this character what are the similarities you know what i mean you're giving advice to people that are already actors I'm, what yes about, and no. What? Some of them were very, be, some of them were beginners. A lot of the students, for some reason, in that class were people who had done comedy, stand-up comedy, or improv, and wanted to go into acting. Several of them were. Now, that's a theoretical thing. I'm saying, start with yourself. How do you do that? There's certain techniques, you know, you can learn. I mean, what I learned as an actor was to relate to imaginary circumstances as real. You know what I mean? So you're not just saying lines, you're actually creating this world. If you're on a stage, you know, maybe you're you're supposed to be in a bedroom. Well, you kind of create a bedroom that means something to you. Maybe there's a bed that you slept on five years ago when you were in a certain state of mind. Maybe there's a painting on the wall. You imagine that's there, that was your mother's and it makes you think of an emotion you shared with you, you know, about your mother. Making the imaginary real. And there's different techniques to use to do that. Yeah. I, I you know, one, I, I, I don't have the temperament to be an acting teacher. Uh, but you studied, you did take acting classes. 
I've taken acting classes and I've worked with a coach. Very what much. Were the, what were the best years. things? For many, what many were some years. of the? What are some of the best things a teacher or a coach has told you to do well, that have well, really helped? Listen, I, I, I love the, listen, uh, I'm not, not to simplify this, right? But first of all, you got to know the text and you got to know what the scene means. Like you said, it's not just learning words. Okay. So what are we trying to do in this scene? You know, Bobby is talking to Tony on the boat, talking about, you know, maybe getting a promotion. So what are we trying to do? So you got to know what the scene's about, not just say the words, okay? And that's what people do, unfortunately, okay? Right, it's not a scene about your father being a barber. It's a scene about you trying to be a, ca a, a boss. What is goal in this scene? What are we trying oh. to accomplish, All right? Okay. Uh, you got it. Now, I think you learn the text as best you can. I mean, I you need to know it front, back, frontwards, backwards, and every which way. I mean, I worked last night. I had a fucking giant fucking paragraph. If I don't know it, I can't act it. I'm thinking. It's You're thinking head. about what the word is. You can't. You got to know it so well that the words come out without you thinking. Yeah. Right? And you've, I know that. You, you're there, right? It just comes out. You don't even have to think yeah, about it. So, you know, I mean, listen, I, I made a backstory for Bobby or for all my characters, even Anthony that I play on Blue Bloods, make a backstory. Maybe his father was a cop. Uh, you know, he's been in the around for 20 years. He was this, he was that. That's a big help because you kind of know the character before you're getting started. Okay, this guy's a doctor. Went to med school. He grew up poor. He grew up rich. That's very important. Like Stevie talked about, right? Uh, as far as uh, like a uh, you know uh, an acting one on one, like from the beginning and sensory and and, and all that stuff, I I wouldn't even know how to tell someone that. You know what I try to do is I I make a backstory. I learn who this guy is in my head. I learn the text the best I can, and I try to deliver it as natural as I possibly can. For me, it's do you believe me as this guy or don't you? Do you believe me as a gangster? Do you believe me as a cop? Do you believe me as a doctor? You know, I know it's simplified, but that's, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm a uh, very big believer in working with a coach. Uh, to this day, I work with someone if it's something I have questions on, you know. I'm very sure. big believer, one-on-one. -on -one. I like one-on-one -on -one more than classes, you know, Mike? You know, basically, you're trying to make the imaginary real. you got to make the simple realities, you know. Um, what you said was interesting, too, about um, what's the scene about? A simple line like, can I have a Pellegrino? And Janice says, shop right, sparkling water, okay. Now, on paper, that could mean fucking absolutely nothing. That can mean right. Pellegrino. I don't have Pellegrino, I have this. There's a whole subtext of family history, resentment, jealousy, bitterness, social climbing in those two lines. And an actress like Aida, who's wonderful and great, understands that and plays it and yeah. knows just, just how to play it enough to get that subtlety subtext across. Somebody brilliant like her and Edie can make one, two words with a whole shitload, like you say, of backstory between her and Tony growing up, jealous that he's rich and she's not, whatever it is. You know, that's what it, that's really what a, what a great actor does. They you have know, all that behind it and can do it and can communicate it. Yeah. I also not just enough to know it mentally. You have to communicate it. You know, I also think, you know, uh, you know, Michael, I, first of all, a lot of acting books to me, and I read, I've got a ton of them, are very convoluted, and I had a very hard time understanding. Uh, for people out there, I've said it before, Michael Caine's book, he's got two great books on acting, and he's got, it's on video, you probably can find it on YouTube, or, uh, 
he kind of simplifies things for me. You know, I also think it's just years of experience that you learn. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I didn't know all this stuff. Until you do it, you don't know it. It's like kind of you could read the bartender's book and know every drink. But until you're there and the lights are on and the music's blasting and you're in the bar and there you got to make change and you got to get the money and they're ordering this drink and that. Well, I had it. I knew it earlier, but now it's boom, boom, boom. And, and then you got to repeat it in the next take and in the next angle with but, the same you, the, you know that the glass in the same hand only. and this in the same thing and saying this on this line and moving on this line. It's only from experience and it takes years. It's not... I don't think you could become a, a great actor in, in, in a year. I mean, I know people have. They just started. They got this job, and they're off and running. But it takes time. It takes, it takes time. It takes a lot and of time. And there's no shortcut, like you said before. There there's is no, no shortcuts. Shortcut. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and I think you got to, if you're going to go into an acting class or an acting teacher, you got to go like a therapist. You got to go with someone that works for you. It's not one size fits all. There's 100%. teachers that yell. There's teachers that coddle. There's teachers that have, you know, their their kind of uh, way to do things. It's not one size fits all. What do you think of uh, Gene Cousineau as an acting teacher? That's the character Henry Winkler, Winkler plays on Barry. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Henry's so great. But, you know, that's, listen, a lot of, I'm not going to say everyone, a lot of acting coaches are failed actors. Yeah. And he's some, he's actually, there's a lot of reality to his character. And some, act, some, just like coaches are failed athletes. When I say failed, they just haven't gone all the way, right? Uh, a lot of people get into the acting. Some people just love teaching. And they want to help people, and I get it. And those are the great ones. And then there's some that, as the Henry Winkler character is, uh, you know, he he's still in the game. He's, he's still, still going on, on auditions acting. for like going on yeah. auditions. You know? Yeah, <laughs> there's still the jealousy. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I don't know if I, you know, I find casting people too. A lot of them try to be actors. Some of them, 99% of them are happy and they want you to get the job and they want to help you get the job. And then you've got the ones that are kind of bitter. And you got actors. You got a lot of actors that had success and for whatever reason it went away and they're very bitter and very jealous. That's what, when we had Stevie Van Zandt on, that's what he yeah. told me. Very I just. Very uh, uh, I just got an email that tr they wanted to clear a clip. So they're making a documentary about Bonnie Timmerman. Bonnie Timmerman's a great casting director. She's yeah. done a lot of great movies and TV watch. shows. Uh, so it's about her and it's about actors. So they have a sequence where they have me, Sam Rockwell, Matthew McConaughey, and Henry Rollins, who was also a punk musician, saying the same line in an audition for the movie Heat. And the line is like, don't lie to me. I can always tell when somebody's lying to me. I, I mean, this was before The Sopranos. And it's just us saying that line. And you see the different ways every actor does. I think Henry Rollins actually got the part. But it's, uh, I didn't see the other clips yet. I only saw mine. They sent it to me to clear it and see if I'd let them use it, which I did. But it was, I haven't seen, I'd never seen tapes of myself auditioning. It was really kind of weird. Wow. This might have been uh, 98. 97 I would love to see kind of wild I would love to see my soprano audition it's got to be somewhere I, I bet Sheila or G Georgiana have it or both. you know there's a lot of people have uh you know if you go on YouTube there's a lot of auditions they have Steve Carell auditioning for uh uh some movie uh you know uh, I think Anchorman you know there's a lot of auditions out there uh, that would be interesting to me I would yeah. like to see that stuff. But there's, you know, it's when you go audition and you could hear them through the door, you hear the guy before I you. I hate that. Saying, it's terrible because it. you may have a tendency to do what he did. No, and you know that when you go in, they're going to hear you, whoever's waiting. 
which I don't like either. No, but do you know what I mean? But, you know, this it might make me think, oh, wait a minute. That's he, the way to do it. He's yeah. doing it really hard. I, I was thinking more softer in my, you know, delivery. And he's coming I in. I hate heavy. that. I hate it. You know, that that's the thing. But that's a good question, Jeremy, uh, from uh, Ontario, Canada. Enjoy your bows. Good question. Thank headphones. you. So thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes released every Monday. Please subscribe. Talking Sopranos Podcast, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. Also, check TalkingSopranos.com for merchandise and for our upcoming live shows. TalkingSopranos.com. Uh, and also on our YouTube channel. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producers Andy Verderon. Music was composed and performed by Elijah Amaton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I are playing together, uh, by clicking the links on TalkingSopranos.com. Zopa will be playing in the great state of New Jersey, Crossroads at Garwood, New Jersey, on October 15th. Go to uh, Eventbrite or the Crossroads New Jersey website. Production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. All right. Great episode. See you later. Yes, eight sir. more to go, my brother. Eight more to eight go. And, eight and out. <laughs>